uh, and be with us. We're going to eat at 6, from 6 to 7, we'll have fellowship dinner, and then service starts at 7 p.m. So please plan uh, to be with us uh, for these things. And also don't, ma'am, the list is on the wall. That's right, the list is on the bulletin board. If you would like to help with bringing food that night, please sign up and plan to help uh, greatly. That would be appreciated. And also, one more thing, don't forget about our Hallelujah Festival that will be on Sunday, November the 4th, starting at 4 p.m. And if you will please read through this on what you need to bring, uh, if you would help out with volunteering and help out bringing uh, goods and things like that, drinks that they're needing. And also, don't forget they're having a chili cook-off. We've been doing this for the last several years, and we always have prizes to give out to those who have the, the hottest and the best tasting and the most creative, different things like that. They have little awards we like to give out. So please plan to be with us on that day. We're going to have a great day in the Lord. Amen. Uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and ask my ushers, my men, if you'll come forward, and we're going to go ahead and receive the morning offerings today. And uh, we're so grateful. And be, please be remembering, and we're fixing to go to the Lord in prayer. Please be remembering those that are on our prayer list. Those that are sick, we do have several outs today, several that told me they were going to actually go on vacation. But be remembering those that are away from us, remembering those that are standing in need, that are sick. Um, I had some special requests today. I can't remember her name, but there was a young girl. She is 26 years old. Uh, Leanne, what? Leanne Ward. She's 26 years old, and she found out she's got to have breast, she has breast cancer. And uh, going to have to have a double mastectomy. Uh, and so please be praying for her. Amen. Uh, you like Philip Judson? They found a brain tumor on his little girl. And they found a brain tumor on his little girl. Is that right? Be praying for this family, the Touchton family. I know exactly who you're talking about. Amen. Be praying for these that are sick and there's many more. Amen. We won't be able to name all of them. But be remembering those that are sick, those that have been in the hospital. Who? Nancy Van, that's right, Nancy Van, I was asked to remember this morning. Be remember those that have been standing in need in our church because you know what? We might have many needs, but remember this, we got a great God. Amen? We serve a God, amen, and a Savior. And so I'm going to remind you today that even though you come in here, you may have burdens and you may have a heavy load and you might have a list this long. Can I tell you something? We serve a God that can handle it. We serve a God also that even when he does not to calm the storms of life, do you know what he'll do? He'll go with you through the storms of life. Amen. And he'll guard your heart and your mind with his peace. Amen. But as we gather, let's, let's pray this morning over the offering today. And let's, let's bless uh, God with our giving today and giving, uh, giving obediently unto the Lord. Amen. Daddy, how about praying for us this morning?
the Lord praise. Amen. And amen. 
Amen. Well, if you want to, you can just leave your Bibles open because I'm going to kind of go through this line by line just for a little while. And Amanda, if you'll go back to the very first verse, I want you to notice what the Apostle Paul begins this chapter with and the words that he says. He says, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers, and I'm going to stop right there, but he says, I don't want you to be unaware of what our fathers went through. One translation renders that verse like this. I do not want you to forget that our fathers, and it begins with under the cloud. He's saying, I want you to be reminded of what our forefathers, if you will, went through and where we come from. You know what, there's a lot of, uh, there are some denominations that will not preach uh, out of the Old Testament or very limit themselves to preaching out of the Old Testament and they base strongly on just the New Testament or on the writings of Paul. But do you know what Paul says here? He says, I don't want you to be unaware of the past. I don't want you to be unaware of what happened in Exodus and in Numbers. And that's why I think it's very important for any believer, for any preacher, to preach the whole Bible. Amen. Study the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Amen. It is one book authored by our God today. Amen. Genesis is just as important as Revelation. But Paul says, I don't want you to be unaware of what happened to them and he was speaking about to Exodus and, and the speaking about numbers. He said, I don't want you to be unaware of what our fathers went through and what happened to them. And then he makes a list, so to speak. He kind of begins to make a list and that's what I did in my notes today. I just made some bullets of what he says. He said, I don't want you to be unaware that, number one, they were under the cloud. Remember we talked about this, about how that God's presence went over them and covered them with the cloud by day. It says that they were all passed through the sea. What was sea was that? That was the Red Sea, remember we talked about. And then Paul tells us, well, really what the, that demonstrated or what that represented. And he said that all of them were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So they were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea. In other words, what he is saying is that to when they crossed through the Red Sea on dry ground, the water on either side, and when that cloud, which is made up of water, is made up of water, when they were covered by that, it was foreshadowing and it was representing baptism. If you didn't know that. How many of you remember we talked about how God led the Hebrew children out of Egypt? The last plague that God brought upon the Egyptians who were holding the Hebrews captive was the death of all the firstborn. Every firstborn, all the children, all of the livestock died that was of the firstborn. But how did the Hebrews protect themselves from that curse? God told them to sacrifice a lamb and take the blood of the lamb and place it on the doorpost of their home. And when the death angel came through the city, he would pass over the people. That night, to, when the Egyptians awoke to all of their firstborn being dead, they told the Hebrews to get out that night to, because of, that God had taken their firstborn or their children. What saved the Hebrews? What truly brought them out? Do you know what it was? It was the blood of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. And that is the very same as it is for us today. It represented... The Old Testament, that represented and it foreshadowed Jesus Christ dying on the cross and His blood being shed to, to free us from the bondage of, of sin and the bondage of the devil. Amen. They were freed by the blood of the Lamb, but also that followed up with a, a foreshadowing of water baptism. They walked through the Red Sea, which was a foreshadowing of our baptism. Can I tell you something? The only way that we are saved today is by the blood of Jesus Christ and by His blood alone. Amen. What Jesus did for you and in what He did for me. But you know what? We are commanded in the Word of God to follow that up with baptism. And I'm so grateful we had ten people. Ten people last Sunday night to take that step of faith and to be baptized, amen. And I'm so honored and grateful that I had the opportunity of doing that, amen. But let's move on. He says this, that they were baptized into the, into the cloud and baptized them through the Red Sea. And he says this, all of them ate the spiritual food. They all ate the manna. All ate the manna that God provided. 
And he also said this, that they all ate, or excuse me, they all drank of the same spiritual drink, water from the rock. What was Paul stating here? Paul was stating that they all experienced the same, or excuse me, they all had the same spiritual experience. All of them. Do you know what? The Bible says that there are, you can study this, that if they get into numbers, they have a census that is taken of the people. And I believe there's over 600,000 uh, men that are prepared to fight to for Israel. The numbers that uh, the Hebrews could have uh, accumulated in this group of people could have been over 2 million as they're traveling along. And Paul specifically says that all of them, all of them went had experienced all of these things. All of them were under the cloud. All of them walked through the Red Sea. All of them ate manna. All of them drank from the rock. All of them had the same spiritual experience. Let me take it another step further. All of them were saved, if you will, the same way. Yeah. They were all saved by that same blood in Egypt, and they were all went through the same baptism. Do you know what? That all of us in here today, if you are a Christian, we've all been saved the same way. Amen. You might not have been in the same place. Might not have been the same time, the same day, same year, but you were saved the same way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And then we were baptized in his name. We were all saved the same way. But, but then he changed his course just a little bit. He begins talking about how they all had the same spiritual experiences. They were all saved the same way. But then he says this in verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased. For their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. In other words, as they made their way from Egypt to, to the promised land, they're going through the wilderness, many, many of them died on the way. Then he tells us why. Why did they die? What happened to them? Was it because they got sick or something? No, listen. It says because they were not well-pleasing to God. And then Paul makes a, another list of the things that they failed to. And he says this, they lusted after evil things. They were idolaters. You remember we talked about the golden calf one Sunday morning? How they made that golden calf. And remember I said over 3,000. God killed over 3,000 of them that day. In other words, they turned from God. And many times judgment fell on them as they were on their way. They committed sexual immorality. And this Paul said 23,000 fell that day. That's a, lot of, that's a lot of graves to dig in. 23,000, Amen. It says they tempted God. They complained according to verse 10. And Paul says all of these things they did and it cost them, if you will. But then Paul gets to verse 11 and he says this. Notice he says, now all of these things happened to them as examples. Examples for who? For us. As they were written for admonition upon whom the end of the age has come. In other words, at the end of the age, just talking about us, at the end, towards the end of time. Admonition. What does that word mean? That they were written for our ad admonition. That word means this. It means a authoritative counsel or warning. It was our warning. These things have been written down for a warning and to caution us. To warn us of what? To warn us possibly of what? Let's look at verse 12. It says this in verse 12. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Let's read that together. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. The New Living Translation says that verse like this. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. If you think you are standing strong in the Lord, you think you've got it all together. You've got this church thing and this uh, Christian thing all figured out. He says you better be careful not to fall. Let me sum up what Paul is saying here. As we look back over the course of history, and as we look around at those uh, uh, around us in the church and in our lives, and, and we may look at their mistakes and we look at their failures, Paul gave us a list of the things in which they failed at. Do you know what we can get this mentality? 
We can build this mentality up in our head. I would never do that. You ever said that before? You ever looked at somebody and you said, well, I would never, I'd never do that. That would never happen to me. Oh, no, that wouldn't happen to me. I wouldn't let that happen. I would never do that. That would never happen to me. Oh, I'm stronger than that. I've got it all figured out. I got it. I'm, I'm a little bit better together than they are. Come on now. You ever had that attitude towards somebody? <laughs> but Paul is warning us in this text. Listen to me. Don't ever think it won't happen to you. Yeah. What is Paul saying? He gives his list of things where they miserably fail at. Then he says, he said, if you think you're standing strong, you better be careful. If you don't think that you won't fail, if you don't think that you as a believer can't fall flat on your face, he said, you are sorely mistaken, my friend. Yeah. And he says, you better be on guard. Don't ever think it won't happen to you. Don't ever think that you couldn't fail. Mm -hmm. Listen to me. We've all been saved by Christ. <laughs> We've been saved by faith believing what Jesus did for us. Do you know what also that tells me? Therefore, we will all be tempted by the devil. Yeah. Yeah. I said, we've all been saved by Jesus Christ and what he did for us, sister. Then we will all, everybody say all, oh. be tempted by the devil and we will be, he will do his best to lead us astray. Yeah. That's a fact today. And Paul says, be careful lest you fall. Let's look at verse 13. He goes on to say in verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. Temptation is a common thing to man. What does that mean? In other words, everyone experiences it. I said everyone experiences it. Everyone experiences it. You are not exempt from temptation of the enemy. The temptation in your life is no different than what others have experienced, even if it was 4,000 years ago. Temptation is temptation. Never think that you're above it. Amen. Did you hear what I said, Christian? Did you hear what I said, Sunday school teacher? Did you hear what I said, song leader? Did you hear what I said, uh, man who thinks you've got it all figured out? Did you hear what I said, strong woman? Never think that you're above tempting. Amen. Don't you ever think, well, look, the devil will never lead me astray. Never think that you're immune to temptation. Oh, nothing's going to no, nothing's going to get to me. I've got it all together. I'm strong. Even if everybody else falls away, I, I'm going to stand strong. I'm going to stand it. No matter what happens. No matter what my friends do. No matter what nobody. I'm going to stand. Never think it won't happen to you. Because that's exactly when it will happen to you. Let me share with you what I'm preaching and who I'm preaching about. Really, I didn't think y'all just just give this to me. Y'all remember a, a man by the name of Peter? We call him Apostle Peter. It says this, Then Jesus said to them, the disciples, All of you, all twelve of them, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. This was the night that Jesus was going to be arrested. This is the night that he would be falsely tried. And then the next day he would be crucified. He said, all of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said, listen to his words. He says, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Mm -hmm. He's boasting. He's sort of, I will never fail you. I will never leave you. I will never stumble. I will not mess up, God. Verse 34, Jesus said, assuredly. Somebody say that with me. Assuredly. assuredly. That means it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I say to you, that this night before the rooster crows, you would deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you. He goes on a little further. Notice he's saying I a lot. He said, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Y'all remember maybe what happened in that story? As Peter tried to get closer to Jesus after he'd been arrested, he denies Christ and Three times, three times he denies him. Peter does exactly what he swore that he would not do. What he boasted of, he failed miserably. 
Don't think failure can't happen to you. Don't think that you won't fall in the midst of temptation. Don't think for one moment the devil cannot get to you because he can. Think about it. Peter, who walked with Jesus, he saw him face to face, who swore he would never deny him, failed miserably. You know, I believe that's why Peter later wrote these words in 1 Peter chapter Chapter 5, I believe it is. In chapter 5, he says this. This is Peter's writing years later after his miserable failure. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all, to, yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. Talks a lot about humility right here. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that you may be exalted in due time, casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you. But then he gets to verse 8 and he says this, be sober. And he says, be diligent because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. In other words, he's saying, he says, don't think you're the only one that's being tempted and attacked by the devil. Mm -hmm. He said, because everyone that is in the brotherhood or everyone that is a Christian is facing these same things. When Peter spoke to Jesus in Matthew, what we just brought up there, he said, I will never fail you. Oh, I will go and I will die with you. Do you know what? There was pride and there was arrogance in Peter's tone there. Oh, I will never, I will never fall. I will never, even if someone else, Lord, I'm stronger than them. I, I've got it all together with them. I'm more faithful than them. But Peter quickly learns that he wasn't. His pride in himself, listen to me. His pride in himself was deflated like a pin to a balloon. And he was quickly humbled before the Lord. Do you know what happened? When that rooster crowed, when that rooster crowed on that third time that he denied Jesus, do you know what Peter realized? Peter realized how weak he was. Yeah. Yeah. I said, that's what happened. Peter realized how weak, how weak this flesh truly was, and he realized what Jesus said was true. A little bit further down in that same chapter, in Matthew chapter 26, later on they go to the garden after Jesus swears, I'm never going to, this is, this is interesting to me, Peter says this, remember, he said, I'm not going to deny you. I will die for you, Jesus. Later on, after that, that was they were tabling of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. They go to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus asked, Peter was one of the disciples, he said, I want you to stay with me and pray. Guess what happened? Jesus walked away from the disciples and he continued to pray. And he come back and they was all asleep. Peter's talking about, hey, I will die for you. I will not deny you. He can't even keep his eyes open. Amen. Glory, that ought to tell him something right there. But I want you to notice this. He says this. Then he came to his disciples and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch for me with one hour? Just one hour? Could you not keep? You're talking about uh, that you're not, if you won't deny me. You're talking about you'll die for me. But you can't even pray with me for just one hour. And he says, watch. I want you to catch these words. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Let me tell you something. When that rooster crowed that morning, after Peter had denied him, Peter realized how true those words were. Mm -hmm. Peter had boasted a lot in himself and his own strength and his own ability to go against the temptation of our adversary, the devil, and he failed miserably. He failed miserably. Can I tell you something? What you need to realize in here today, folks, that as we are, we are humans, therefore we are weak. This flesh, what does it say, is weak. Boy, that's the first step that we need to take when it comes to battling temptation. That's the first thing that we need to come to realization is that this flesh is weak. Realize that you're weak and cannot fight the devil alone. Did you hear what I said? You've got to realize that we are weak and we cannot fight the devil alone. Yeah. 
We can't stand under that temptation and the things that he may try and lead us to. Don't be as prideful as Peter because Peter soon came to realize how much he needed and he relied on God's grace. Therefore, he wrote in 1 Peter 5, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Peter goes on to say in verse 8 to, that we were reading, Be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks around as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Never think the devil has stopped hunting you. Never think, I said, that the devil has stopped hunting you, Christian. Never think, well, I'm in a place the devil's just going to leave me alone. My family, we got it all together. Everybody's saved and everybody's doing good. And we just kick back a little bit because life's going to be a little bit easier because we got saved and baptized. We're going to church now. The devil's going to leave us alone. Yeah, right. That's exactly right, Danny. Paul said, I mean, Peter said, be sober, be diligent. Because it's when we get complacent that he'll strike. That's why Peter says, stay alert and watch out for that great enemy, the devil. I want to share with you how, how on guard you need to be. How on guard that you need to be of temptation that can lead you astray. Temptation, folks, listen to me. Well, it's just a little sin. Listen to me. That temptation can lead you in such a way to destroy your marriage. It can destroy your family. Destroy your future. Destroy what God, destroy your ministry. You have to understand something. Destroy your ministry if you're not careful. Listen to what James says. How, how, how cautious do we need to be when it comes to the devil and his tricks? James chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, says this. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own, everybody say own, own. desires and enticed. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires. You know what I heard a pastor say the other day, a preacher say? He says, I don't even trust myself. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't even trust myself. Myself, and it's to begin with. I kind of like, well, what? What did he mean by that? I don't even trust myself. Think about Peter. Peter boasted in himself. I will never forsake you. I will never deny you. Do you know what? Oftentimes we will build up in our mind and we will boast in our mind things that we will never do. We might say, well, I would never commit adultery. Oh, I, I would never have sex outside of marriage. Oh, I would never fall into addiction to maybe such as alcohol, drugs, or pills. I would never fall into pornography. I would never deny Christ. You ever had one of those? I would never. Oh, I'd never do that. I'd never do this. Listen to me right now. You cannot trust yourself when it comes to temptation. That's why it's so important, Christian, listen to me. That there are certain places that you don't need to go. There are certain people that you don't need to hang around. There are certain situations that you cannot afford to place yourself in. Why? Why? Listen to me. Because not even you, not even you know what you will do when the pressure is on. I said not even you know what you will do when the pressure is on. Do you know that's one reason there's certain places I will surely not go? Why? Because you know what? Even if I, as the pastor, get pressure, get temptation in the certain on certain things, do you know what I'll fall to? Come on now. I'm a human being. I'm always real with you. But there's certain things I know I don't need to place my oh, say, oh I would never, I'd never go get drunk. I say, well, I would never do that. But then place yourself in the bar. Place yourself around it where a bunch of people enjoy and having good. When temptation's there, you don't know what you're doing when that pressure's on. Mm -hmm. You have to guard yourself. And the Bible says, guard your heart. I've had a lot of young people that come to me over the years that I have taught and I have, I have uh, ministered to. And one of those things that, that I was always strong on is abstinence and no sex before marriage. And I had many of them 
Tell me, I would never have sex outside of marriage. I had many of those same ones come back to me and they would tell me how they had failed. You don't know what you'll do until you get the pressure, that pressure on you. And that's why you've got to guard your heart and you've got to guard yourself. And you've got to do your best to stay out of places and around situations and circumstances that will put that pressure on you. Anybody see what I'm coming from here today? You say, oh, I'm strong. I got it all together. I wouldn't ever give into that. Don't put so much faith in yourself. But you better listen to what the Word of God says. Amen. Not even you know what you would do until the pressure is on. That's why Jesus, and what does Jesus instruct us to do in Matthew chapter 26, 41? It says this, watch and pray, lest you fall, enter into temptation. The spirit in need is willing, but the flesh is weak. He said, man, I know you've got good intentions, Peter. I know, I know what you're saying, but you've got to understand that this old flesh is weak and you can't do it alone. He said, you've got to watch. In other words, that's be wise. Be wise to where you go. Be wise to who you hang around. Be wise to the situations that you put yourself in. That's what Jesus is saying there. If you know you'll be tempted there, then don't go there. If you know, young people, you'll be tempted when you get in the back seat of that car to go further than you have said that you would, then don't go there. He said, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. Can I tell you something today? Don't neglect your prayer life. If you want to stand against worldly temptations that can lead you astray, Stay connected to Jesus Christ through prayer. Remember that how Jesus taught us to pray. You remember how Jesus taught us to pray? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth and is it in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation. It goes on to say, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus told us to pray because he knew that we were going to be faced with temptations. He knew that we were going to be faced with temptations by the devil that would lead us astray, that could destroy our lives, destroy our families, destroy, destroy our marriages, destroy what the future that God has for you. He says, stay connected in prayer. You know what? You can read throughout the Gospels. You can read throughout to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will find that Jesus himself spent many hours in prayer. He would get up early in the morning, and he would steal away and get away from the disciples, and he'd go to prayer. Sometimes he would send them on across. One time he sent them on across the Sea of Galilee. And he went up into the mountains to pray. He prayed many hours in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let me tell you something. If Jesus himself needed to pray into the Father, how much more do we need to pray in order to face what we face in this generation? Listen to Philippians 4, 6. I'm not telling you this to scare you. I'm not telling you this to say, well, you're fixing to fall flat on your face. But I am encouraging you to be watchful and to restore your prayer life. Paul writes later in Philippians, he says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Can I tell you something? When you stay connected to the Lord, when you stay connected in prayer, can I tell you one thing He will do? He can guard our hearts and He'll guard our minds. Boy, y'all sleep this morning today. I said He will guard our hearts and He will guard our minds. In closing, let's look at the main case. If y'all come on to the music. Listen to this again. No temptation has overtaken you except is common to man. I know everybody faces it. But God is...
faithful. Let's say that together. But God is faithful. He goes on to say, He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Every one of us will be faced with temptation. The devil will try and lead us astray. But you know what? The Bible says God is faithful. You know what that's saying? That you're not alone in that temptation. That you're not fighting on your own. Because as a saved, as a Christian, you know what? You've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. You're not standing strong in your own strength. Because the flesh is weak, but you've got God. You've got the Holy Spirit inside of you that will give you the strength to take a stand, church. Will you stand up all over the, the house? God is always, always with us. And God will always make a way of escape. But can I tell you something? You've got to be willing to look for those escape routes. You've got to be looking for those way out, amen, when we're tempted. He promises that he would stand up with us and go with us and help us to bear that load. Let me tell you something. You are not exempt from temptation. You're not exempt from failure. We must be on alert at all times as Christians. And we must be reassured today that we're not alone, but he's fighting with us. I don't know who that message is for you today. I don't know what you may be battling. Maybe there's something in here today you have fallen to. And I want to encourage you this morning. It's time to get back up. If there's some area of your life that you've been a led astray into, into temptation, I don't care what it is. You know what it is. God's already dealing with your heart. Then I want to encourage you this morning to get back up. But do that by first getting on your knees and saying, Lord God, I, I failed. Do you know that, that Jesus later restored Peter? He talked with Peter along the Sea of the Galilee and he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And he kept him feed my sheep. He tested him again. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Jesus, Peter said, yes. And he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. And he asked him the third time, do you love me? Peter began to get a little agitated. He said, Lord, yes, you know I love you. He said, then feed my sheep. In other words, keep doing what I've called you to do. Don't think because of your failure, just because of where you messed up, that it has disqualified you from my service. But he says, now it's time to get back up. If you love me, then get back up and keep going. We will fail. We will fall short just like the Apostle Peter did. But let me tell you something. You rely on God's grace to keep moving and keep going in the right direction. As we sing today, the altar is open. Amen.